Eventually, Pharaoh let the Jews go, as documented in the book of Exodus, but after the dramatic and miraculous escape into the wilderness, they lost faith in the God who had liberated them, and after just two months in the wilderness, they were drawn back to the worship of false gods in the desert, the same gods that they'd been surrounded with all their lives in Egypt. While Moses was at the top of Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God, the people at the foot of the mountain began to wonder if he was ever coming down again. They lost faith and demanded that new gods be made to show them the way. They built a golden calf and claimed that this was the god that had led them out of slavery. Now why a golden calf? Well remember that Nimrod was represented by a bull and had a crown of bull horns because the Chaldean word for ruler also meant bull. Thus a bull was chosen to symbolise Nimrod in his worship, and gold was chosen because gold was a depiction of the colour of the sun. Incidentally, have you ever wondered why Satan is often depicted with bull horns coming out of his head? And have you ever wondered why Hindus regard bulls as sacred? It seems random, doesn't it? But now you know. Look for the threads, connect the dots, and you'll always end up back at Babylon. With your understanding of Babylon from the series so far, you should begin to see connections you hadn't seen before. Following after the abominable patterns of worship set by Nimrod and Samiramis, which included sexual rituals and fornication, Moses returned from the mountain to find the Israelites defiling themselves by reveling in this kind of behaviour. They defiled themselves in every sense by worshipping the satanic god, allowing idols into their camp and in the depraved acts they perpetrated in his name. Now we have already seen examples of the cancerous spread of wickedness in the world, and the same was threatening to happen amongst God's chosen people here. Moses had to take swift action to purge the camp. A little yeast is quick to infect the whole batch, and the Jews simply had to be kept holy. They were absolutely vital to God's master plan of salvation for the world. If they too were lost to paganism, there was no hope for mankind. The whole world would be doomed to hellish misery and destruction. If the Jews did not survive as a righteous people devoted to God, then there would be no people group through whom Jesus could be born. The Messiah, who was destined to die on a cross for the sins of the world, overcoming death and Satan in the process, to free mankind from the yoke of slavery that was currently under, could not come. The Bible that tells us about those events would never have been written, meaning we would be without hope. The very existence of hope, life and liberty hinged on what happened to the Jews. It was that important. Moses made a tough decision. He asked all those who were on the Lord's side to come to him. They were then told to strap on their swords and kill those who weren't. Around 3,000 died that day. This incident is used by modern atheists to portray God as a bloodthirsty monster, unworthy of worship. But if those 3,000 hadn't died, and the Jews had turned to paganism and Jesus hadn't come, I doubt if there would even be a world today. And if there was, it would be hell on earth. Satan would be running amok and there would be nothing but wickedness, depravity, pain and misery. We only have to look in further detail at some of the practices associated with the ancient gods to get an idea. For example, take Molech, who was the form of Marduk or Nimrod worshipped by the Ammonites. We read in Leviticus that part of their rituals involved child sacrifice and cannibalism. God warned Moses about this repeatedly. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed, to be passed through the fire to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Human sacrifices and fire were part of Nimrod's worship from the very earliest days, of course, because fire was seen to be the earthly representation of the sun. Later, in Jeremiah 32:35, we read, They built high places for Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to sacrifice their sons and daughters, causing them to pass through fire to Molech, though I never commanded, nor did it enter my mind that they should do such a detestable thing and so make Judah sin. In the same way, God's priests in the tabernacle used the meat of the animal sacrifices for food, so the priests of Baal did also eat of their human sacrifices. In fact, this is where we get the word cannibal from. The Chaldean, Kanabal, means priest of Baal. Don't let anyone attempt to portray God as a murderous villain, slaughtering innocent women and children. We are talking about the defeat of depravity from the pit of hell. People who sacrificed their own children and ate their flesh. The camp had to be kept holy, a concept our world understands little about. 
We should also see in this episode the burning hatred God has for sin and remember how vital it is for us to remain righteous in his sight today. Because of Jesus, there is now no need for bloodshed when we sin and this has perhaps diminished our understanding of its severity. We should remember, however, that the punishment for sin is as severe today as it always has been. It's just that Jesus already spilled his blood so that we don't have to. When we sin, we deserve death just as much as those Israelites who turned away from God. Thank Jesus he has taken the punishment on our behalf. Perhaps as further punishment for that generation, perhaps to build character, perhaps to continue the purging process, and perhaps because we develop a deeper relationship with God in times of trial, almost certainly a mixture of all four of these, God decided to keep them in the desert for 40 more years. God needed to get these people to trust him and to build a relationship with him, and the wilderness, a place where they had to rely on him even for food and water, served that purpose. One final thing I'd like to highlight about the desert years. Notice how God chose to reveal himself to Moses. He chose to reveal himself at the top of Mount Sinai, a mountain. Remember that Babylonian ziggurats were built to represent mountains and the apexes were said to be where the gods lived. Remember this is as a result of Satan's desire to be the Most High. Because all ancient mythologies and false religions stem from Babylon, you'll find parallels of this in many cultures. Mount Olympus, for example, is famously where the Greek gods were supposed to have lived. The fact that God revealed himself to Moses at the top of a mountain clearly echoes this idea. It is likely God did this so the Israelites could understand what was going on when Moses ascended Sinai. They were used to the idea that deities lived at the top of mountains. This appears to be God using what they already knew to communicate that he was their God, talking to them in a symbolic language they could understand. And since ziggurats were built by man to glorify man and their gods were said to reside there, God was showing his superiority again by revealing himself atop a mountain that he'd made, a real one, and on ground that was so much higher than any ziggurat. What God was saying to his people is that he was the real, most high. Just to connect some more dots with this, remember that Jesus' most famous sermon is the Sermon on the Mount. This wasn't an accident. By choosing that location, he was subtly revealing himself in the symbolic language to be God. You see, the Bible starts to reveal extra layers when you understand the nature of the battle.